This is Face Air Respira, a platform for conversations on Eritrea. Your host, Rissam Mesfin. Can you point out Eritrea on the map? No, is it called Eritrea? It is called Eritrea. It's getting warmer. <laughs> That's not a country. Do you know what an Eritrean is? No. Have you ever heard of the country of Eritrea? Nope. Do you know what continent it's on? Africa? Yeah! Yeah, that's right. Ladies and gentlemen, we are delighted to present Chris Carter, an American citizen who owns and operates Taylor Made Media and Tribe Sound Records, uh, where uh, he spends his time producing music and uh, managing film and commercial video projects. He produces for many award-winning musical artists and works closely with several large organizations both in the uh, U.S. and abroad. His experience and ambition has led Chris around the world, working in the United States, Africa, Europe, Central and South America. When Chris isn't traveling or found in the editing room, you're likely to find him on stage, drumming it up with his band, Wave Radio. I don't know what to expect. I mean, based on what people have said, the refugees who've spent time there, it sounds like not a very pleasant place. They really have no hope. They're not looking for help, they're just looking to get out. Eritrea has one of the most repressive governments in the world. The door to the prison was only opened once every two weeks, so they could take out the bodies. More than half the country has left, approximately. They control everything. If you're viewed as a threat to the power of the government, you could be arrested. So the members of his own cabinet were rounded up and arrested and put into prison. Human rights is a myth in Eritrea. We barely know what our rights are. We only know our duties. This is where she lives. Now smugglers are asking for even $60,000 to release a person. A blanket was thrown around them at night and they were thrown into the back of a truck. Tens of thousands of refugees have taken to the streets to protest. You don't stay in Israel. Go your country. Go your country. I'm ashamed of my country for the way they are treating the refugees. Ask me outside if there were any solutions. I don't know. I don't know if they are here. Chris Cotter, thank you for responding so promptly and agreeing to be on the program. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. 
Chris, uh, you are from Philadelphia, you said? I am. Okay. How in the world did you even know there is a place um, called Eritrea? And just share with us the genesis of your introduction to Eritrea. Okay, sure, I'd love to. Uh, so I'm I'm a traveler. I love traveling. Um, uh, my first time to Africa, I climbed Kilimanjaro, and, and I did a safari, and I did the tourist thing. Um, and I've I've been able to I've been lucky enough to travel around the world mostly for adventure. I wanted to do something a little bit more than just pass through a country. So I started to research different humanitarian topics um, to produce a documentary about them. A friend of mine, um, his father is an author and heard about, and he, you know, he, he tuned me into the Eritrean refugee crisis. And I did a little bit of reading and um, met a few few fellows here in the Philadelphia area that run EritreanRefugees.org, which is a nonprofit that helps Eritrean refugees around the world. After speaking with them quite a few times and finally getting more and more clear on what the issues that Eritrean, the Eritrean people face, I decided then that was this is a perfect subject, mainly because I've never even heard of the country. And secondly, because the scope of the issue was, was so great, I just felt it needed to have some light sh shown on it. So you are now finding things about Eritrea. Um, what is it that you're finding out, and what is the objective of that finding out? The objective of the film is, is mostly to raise awareness to all of the refugees that have left Eritrea. I mean, speaking about the conditions in Eritrea, Basically, what we did was we went to um, refugee camps in Ethiopia, um, including the Afar region. So we went to the Shire region, we went to Mayaini and Hitzes and um, uh, Adi Hurush, and then we went to the Afar region. And we gathered different stories from many refugees. I think we interviewed over 50 refugees. And we, you know, we, we got more information about what, the reasons why they left the, the country. And a lot of it, as I'm sure you know, basically from, you know, the ruling of the, the political party, the PFDJ, and um, kind of the oppression that political party is, has been imposing, and people can't take it anymore, and they leave. And, and this, I'm sure you're all very aware of. So I wasn't. So for me to go to that country um, of Ethiopia and talk to the people who have left Eritrea um, was a real eye-opener eye for us. So, Chris, you're, uh, I'm seeing pictures of you uh, interacting, sitting next to Eritrean refugees. When you're sitting with these uh, ladies and gentlemen, children, adults, and men and women, what stories are jumping at you? What impression are these, uh, these refugees making? What, what stories do you have that, that stand out for you? The first thing that surprised me was the fear that a lot of refugees have of having their face on camera and the fear that they have of their families back home being oppressed because they have left themselves. That was the first thing that really stood out to me. Coming from the United States, we have all these freedoms and, and rights that we all too, it's, it's all too common that we take it uh, for granted, those, those rights and freedoms. So to go to another country and to hear that, you know, even the people that have left the country, in fact, even people in the United States are afraid to talk to a journalist because they're afraid that um, at home their families are going to be punished because that they talked to a journalist or even the, the fact that they had left the country. That was, that was the first thing that really, you know, was a real eye-opener for me. Aside from that, I mean, we, we heard stories of you know, the indefinite forced military conscription. We heard people being shot at the border, and we heard of people being, especially like in, in the far region, we heard more oppression, such as, you know, if a, a herdsman went out to take care of his cattle, he would, he would maybe be killed or buried alive. We heard that not, you know, only the, only the government has the ability to conduct business from the far region. Uh, we just, you know, these are all different things, um, that we heard from the refugees themselves, including 
um, the conditions in the prisons of Eritrea, which are appalling based on the stories that we heard from the refugees. In terms of hardships, are you also talking with uh, women and, and how they're treated? And what specific hardships do you have that you came across that also stands out for you? A lot of what people had said, you know, aside from the conditions in Eritrea, you know, and a lot of the people, especially in the Shiari region, most of it was uh, centered around the military conscription and, and not having a family life. And then, you know, if you want to have a family, you have to do something about it. This one woman was imprisoned for no real reason. She was imprisoned just asking about what happened to her friend. And most of her problems for her story happened after she had left the country where she was trafficked and raped and just just a really heart-wrenching awful story and it seems like every step along her her journey she had the same same she, she faced the same issues were they safe in in communicating with you and sharing their stories with you how were you able to uh, to uh, to gain their trust uh, an american citizen they do not speak english most of the time perhaps how are you communicating with them and how did you gain their trust for them to share with you uh, some uh, emotional uh, stories i think what really helped us was the um, that nonprofit I was telling you about the Eritrean refugees dot org? Uh, they uh, enabled us to get into the refugee camps first of all, which is challenging for an American just to say, "Hey, I just want I want to go to refugee camps and talk to some refugees." It just doesn't it doesn't traditionally happen. Um, so they allowed me to, in conjunction with ERA, go into these refugee camps. And what what I think really helped us gain the trust of the refugees was that part of my team um, were two refugees. We had a refugee who was our guide, and he, he knew his way around the camps. He knew his, he worked closely with ERA, and we had a translator who was a refugee as well. I think that helped a lot. And the other thing was, you know, out of thousands of people, there were only a few that would talk to us. So I think a lot of people didn't trust us, and a lot of people just, you know, didn't think that you don't think that we can do anything to help them in fact at one point on our trip in Adi Harush um, one of the refugees says what, what do you think you can do you know you, lots of people come here to see you know what's happening to to us but nobody does anything what do you think you can do can you share with us the number of places you've actually visited and uh, the size of the populations, if you could estimate in those places? I mean, I know off the top of my head, we visited three camps in the Shire region of Ethiopia. One was Adi Harush and Mayaini and Hitzes. Um And uh, I believe Hitzes at that point, this is a year ago, was about 9,000 people. Mayaini, I'm unsure of the population. I, I believe it was around 16,000 people. And Adi Hurush was over 25,000 people, um, which is, you know, staggering numbers. And at, in Hitais, we were pretty surprised to find out, and I know it's probably escalating at this point, that camp was getting in 60 refugees a day. So I, I think that number was really shocking to us to think 60 people every day come in to that one camp. And, you know, there's, there are other camps and other refugee agencies in the area in Sudan and, and uh, you know other places just to think of this that one camp getting 60 a day is that's a lot of, that's a lot of people it's a lot of people uh, again uh, there is also all kinds of uh, outlets uh, from Sudan to the Red Sea and so all kinds of uh, opportunities for people to uh, to exit uh, very hard also very dangerous um, yeah. moving Absolutely. moving on the fact that you have a camera the fact that you're actually taping these conversations does that make them even more leery to talk with you that this is just a documentary and that it could actually be used against them absolutely um that you'll see a lot of blurred faces in their documentary because of those reasons and um and that's what we ended up learning that 
if you are found to talk to journalists or if you are just seen that you have fled the country, your family is, you know, imprisoned or fined back at home. And I think that was that was a large that was a that was a little bit of a hurdle for us um, gathering stories. But you know, we we did find a lot of people that thought if we were going to tell the story, it had to have a face. And there were there's some really brave individuals. I mean, first of all, I think everyone was terribly brave just to share their story. And I think a lot of people just thought that having a face to the story was more important than their safety. And um, they they allowed us to use their faces. So as a matter of fact, which shocked us the most. So after the refugee camps, we went to Israel. We coincidentally showed up there when they were having a large protest from the African migrant community. And um, I was interviewing someone and we were talking about uh, you know, his, his experience crossing the border and whether or not it was difficult. And somebody from the protest took his picture and he had to discontinue the interview with me because he was afraid that the person that took his picture would send it to the government and his family back at home would be pressured or fined or imprisoned. You know, that, 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 that kind of thing doesn't happen in the United States. Chris, how about the emotional well-being from your perspective? Uh, I'm not sure what your expertise is in psychology and all this um, emotional condition of humans, but were you able to discern how they were faring as humans, as people who you said were just scared and very afraid? Uh, how did they strike you in terms of their emotional well-being? I think most of everyone I spoke with were mostly frustrated. They didn't see that the international community wasn't helping any, in any way. Uh, they felt like they're sitting in these refugee camps, wasting away with no hope for a future. And when somebody doesn't have a hope for a future, for their future, they'll um, take chances. And these chances will be um, leaving the relative security of a refugee camp, say, in Ethiopia, and then try to travel um, either to Libya and try to get to Italy, you know, through the Mediterranean Sea, or um, to Israel and be kidnapped and extorted by the uh, Bedouins in the Sinai or the Rashida in the Sinai. And, uh, you know, and even when you do get to the place where you think is safe, you're possibly not treated very well by the, the, the government of that country. Um, and that's what we were seeing in Israel. I think the, the frustration in these, in these camps are the biggest problem, which leads people to hopelessness, and that makes people take really, really, you know, try to make some really risky decisions. So let's go back to the refugee camp, and then, of course, we're headed ultimately to, uh, to Israel, a place that you have apparently visited. Were you able to also experience or see the inside of a... Um, place where the refugees live, the inside, the these tents that we see, mm-hmm. the food that they eat. And so could you share with us what you actually saw with your own eyes, as far as their residence is concerned, and their livelihood in these uh, camps? We actually had uh, the opportunity to spend some time in a tent with, with, a, with a couple of um, guys that, that, who had just left. They'd only been in the refugee camp for about a month. They were pretty happy. They were happy to be out of of Eritrea. They're happy that they didn't get shot on the border. They have. They were happy to make it to where, as far as they had made it. They had only been gone for a month. We talked to a few camp protection officers, and uh, we learned that a lot of the problems that they have in in these camps are just the sheer number of people and trying to provide for all those people enough food, enough shelter was the biggest concern that they had. Medical things like uh, you know enough antibiotics for people and just quality of items there so you know it was a, a pretty meager existence in a refugee camp if they had anything especially when they first get to these refugee camps they start to have a little bit of hope there and unfortunately if you sit around in a place like that for six years of course that hope is going to dwindle and fade so walk us through if you will your travels and then how they're traveling. So here you are, you have all the uh, privileges of being a Westerner, 
And so, mm-hmm. can you share with us how that destination is for you to Israel, and then compare that with the experience of a refugee now? So let's see. Let's have a, a picture of these two destinations. Well, actually, it's okay. a one destination, but two humans, and a Westerner and an Eritrean. How does that look like? Well, I mean, I think it was. I mean, compared to an Eritrean refugee, my my travels were pretty easy. Um, you know, I, I had enough money and a passport. You know, I could take a plane, I could rent a car, I could do anything that I needed to do to get to where I needed to go. I could pay for a hotel room. I had a passport, and I was a citizen of you know, the United States. So I ran into very, very little problems. I, I would say our problems in general were typical typical issues, flat tires and logistics of just getting around. And it was nothing abnormal from any other trip that I've done in my life. I would say for a refugee, they face problems all along the way. I mean, from being shot at the border to the, the fear of their families being imprisoned and, and back in their home country of Eritrea to being trafficked, maybe getting to a refugee camp. Finally, if you get to a refugee camp, you feel as though no one is listening to you, no one can help you you lose hope, you continue to just try to find another option, and that option may land you in, you know, being kidnapped by, I think I said before, the, the Bedouins, tortured and extorted for thousands of U.S. dollars that your family back home just doesn't have, for them to sell every possession that they have, right on the street, and gather money from the rest of your family just to get you out of being tortured. And finally, People go to Israel and they're having issues in Israel with their their right and they're, they're not having their asylum checked, they're not having their refugee status checked. And, um, or, which is more common right now, is people are going to try to cross the Mediterranean um, to get to Italy. And as we've seen even today, where 300 people drowned or died of hypothermia in uh, the Mediterranean. It's just, you know, I I don't have those, I didn't have those problems. I didn't, that didn't even enter my mind. I was just there to do, you know, my job and try to help as much as I could. And these people are still facing these issues, which is the reason why we're trying to finish this film as quickly as we can. Well, yes, and you're referring to the um, the disappearance of uh, the 300 who have uh, disappeared and they're trying to locate them. So as we do this interview, we're trying to reconfirm news of this um, uh, tragic situation in the making. And so we'll be following that up. And so um, we will go from there. Let's talk about Israel and what you're actually learning in Israel. What is it that that is different in Israel as compared to Ethiopia? So when we got to Israel, the story has changed a little bit since we had been there. I know that they, they've, um, the Supreme Court has ruled against the law that people were protesting before, but I'm, I'm, I haven't been staying too current on that law. But I know that they drafted a new one, and it's similar in a, in a way, but I, I'd have to research that more to give you an exact answer. But anyway, the situa- situation while we, when we were there um, kind of went like this refugees would make their way to Israel. And a lot of these ref- refugees have been there under something called kind of a, a protection status. Um, asylum applications weren't being checked in Israel and, and to my knowledge are still not being checked, especially by Sudanese and um, Eritreans. Um, the, there was a leg- uh, um, legislation was passed, I think the, a few months before we showed up, that labeled the African migrant population of um, Israel infiltrators and work migrants. So part of part of this problem is this legislation allowed Israelis to put African migrants into a detention center. Now this detention center originally it was more like a normal prison, but then this legislation said, okay, it's unconstitutional to put them in normal prison. So we'll put them in this open prison. And the open prison was a lot like the regular prison. I mean, the doors were open during the day. We had to check in three times a day. It was hours away from any city. You know, in Israel, it was near the Egyptian border. 
And it was the same food as in the prisons. You're guarded by the same guards as the prisons. So a lot of people just didn't see the difference between being in this open prison and being in, you know, the regular prison of, of um, Israel. So that was the situation when we got there. And a lot of the African migrants have kind of made their way into the community, uh, uh, the Israeli community. So a lot of people that work in the hotels, a lot of people that work in the restaurants and, you know, the, the street cleaners and, you know, just the lower end jobs that migrants could get in Israel, they decided to have a work strike and march the Knesset. And uh, I think it was pretty effective. It definitely, it was a, a big deal while we were there. And it really surprised a lot of Israelis. I see this uh, in one of your uh, um, shots there. Um, actually, there was a video of a, an Israeli gentleman uh, who was not behaving in a gentlemanly fashion. It was very hostile and was asking the refugees to go back to their country. So uh, did the Eritreans uh, have a conversation with you about the hostility toward them and uh, the uh, the punishments yeah. they actually endure? Yes. Yeah, and I, you know, and I think I think a lot of it is is not necessarily the Israeli people's fault. I think they're just not educated. Like they don't understand really what's happening in, in the home country. And a lot of it is um, the Eritreans when they when they. So if you think about it from an, an Israeli perspective, an Israeli has has to you know go into the military as well. I think they have a three year um, military service that they have to do. So when an Eritrean comes and says, I'm, I'm here because I, I left this horrible slavery-like life of the military conscription, what an Israeli hears is, I have left, I have basically dodged the draft to come here. And then when an Eritrean says, I've come here, I, I want to work, I don't want to be I don't want to be taken care of, I want to work my way through and, and kind of earn my own keep. An Israeli see, hears that and thinks, oh, well, you're just a work migrant. You're here to take our jobs. So a lot of the time, it's really just what the Israelis hear is, I'm an infiltrator into your country. I've dodged military service in my country, and I'm here because I can't make money at my, in my home country. That's what they're hearing, and a lot of it is kind of portrayed that way and I'm assuming mostly by, you know, the, the government. Um, and what they're doing is they're just trying to make African migrants' lives really difficult in Israel so they'll go home. But that's just not an option. I would say, yes, I mean, this, the, the man that, that, that is in that film was frustrated and, and probably a little bit afraid of the amount of people that are coming to his country and to him it's, he thinks that all these people are just coming to take jobs and kind of ruining his economy and they're not like you know for example Darfur refugees would come to Israel and they really pulled on the heartstrings of, of the Israelis because they, to them it was very clear it's genocide and, and that's that's what was going on but in these re Israelis are not informed on the issues they don't understand really what's happening in Eritrea because Eritrea is so closed there's a lot of the world that just doesn't even know what's happening in that country. That's the biggest problem. There's no, there's no information about what's going on. There's no, there's no story that allows these Israelis to really understand what's, what's happening. So, you know, I'm an American. I have a passport. I'm in, I'm in Israel. I'm sitting down and I'm having uh, an, a meal. And we start talking about why we're there to the bartender. And the bartender's at first, he has a stance of like, oh, these African migrants are here to take their jobs and, and all this, and they're infiltrators and they're horrible and everything else. And then I started telling him about the refugee camps that we had just been in. And I started telling him about the stories of the problems that they, that they told us. And little by little, he started to understand and he, he started to question thoughts. He started to feel maybe that his feelings were more, were incorrect, you know? And by the time we were done our meal, he was willing to listen to us and he was willing to research a little more on his own. And I think that's really the, I mean, that's the, that is the hope for the documentary really is to give people a little bit of information. And, and at the very least, what I've experienced is not to say that everything is a hundred percent black and white, but this is what I've experienced. This is a story that I can present to you and, and as honest as I can present it. And then from there, you can draw your own conclusions. You can do your own research and you can find out the truth. 
Well, there was also at least one gentleman who said um, in a sad tone that he was ashamed of the way uh, the refugees were uh, being treated in his country. And so yeah. I think that kind of... Did you have a conversation with folks like that who have uh, a, a welcoming attitude towards refugees and actually empathize with them? Well, a lot of, I mean, every NGO that we met with, a non-governmental organization that we met with in Israel were there to help or the um, African migrants. So there, there were a lot of Israeli people that were on the side of the African migrant and specifically the Eritrean people. Every non-governmental organization that we interviewed, you know, they're there to help refugees. They're there to help, um, you know, whether it be uh, HIAS is, is an organization, Physicians for Human Rights, um, Amnesty International, all these organizations that we interviewed, a lot of them were there to try to help the refugees that have made it there. So I think there, I mean, it's it, usually it seems to be the people that know more about the reasons why these refugees are leaving the country are more sympathetic to them being there than the people that just are uninformed. To be a human being, if you knew really what was going on and the reasons for these people leaving Eritrea, I can't imagine anyone not being on the side of the refugee if they're actually informed. Chris, you've talked to uh, various American officials. Could you could you share with us who who you talked with and uh, what you got out of those conversations? The biggest interview that we we got in the documentary was uh, our the United States Assistant Secretary of State Ann Richard, um, and. Um, she and she says, and I think I put a clip up on uh, Facebook that she says that what shocked her the most was um, the amount of children that are un- unaccompanied in these refugee camps. And this is a woman who spends her career being ambassador of the United States, like in these refugee camps. You know, so and she's our face in the refugee camps, and she she brings back the information that she learns to her leaders and her her bosses and and and. Um, for her to say how shocked she was about the amount of children that are unaccompanied was saying something for her. Uh, she's, she's, um, you know, I think, I think we're all pretty concerned uh, with what's going on being in the Horn of Africa. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a big problem. At some point um, in the refugee camp, actually, someone asks you if there was any hope, in, and then you sounded very resigned, and you say, "There's, there's no hope here." Is there any hope at all for these guys? I would like to say yes. I feel like as soon as you lose hope, really awful things happen. As long as there's somebody out there that's willing to tell their story and somebody that's that's willing to broadcast the kind of the message of the underdog, there's always some hope. You know, um, as long as people are being led into the United States, you know, the United States and, and meeting with Anne Richard, I think she said that uh, there's about a thousand. Eritreans that are, are settled to the United States a year. I believe that's that's what she said. I mean, there's some hope there, but I think what the rest of the world needs to do is open up a little bit more and help resettle these refugees and, and get them into some safety. You know, they, they deserve it at this point. You know, they, I mean, they, they deserved it from forever. Um, the fact that they can't have that kind of safety and freedom in their own country is horrible but we should be able to provide that based on the Geneva Convention in our own countries. You know, so I think there should be hope. I, I think that there's still a fight to, to be fought. I think people are, are going to, to really have the, kind of have the back of the Eritrean refugee. Are you going to contact Eritrean authorities in the United States or perhaps even in Eritrea and ask them exactly what in the world is uh, is going on in their country and what they're doing to their own people. Yeah, I, I, we, and I think I think Eritreans, depending... First of all, yes, we're planning on going to the embassy and, and uh, talking to them uh, very soon. It's not easy to get... I mean, I've sent emails to the embassy. They don't respond to me. It's not easy to to get an appointment with them. Yeah, I don't I don't know what our next step there will be, except for going there and knocking on the door, which is something we're planning on doing. The Eritreans that we have met, 
who have a vision of their, most of them are um, living in the United States, that have a vision of their homeland that's positive, a lot of them seem to be kind of a privileged few that are, you know, treated well. And, or maybe they left before things got really, you know, got worse in, in their home country. I think this film helps them to just being more aware, at least giving them a little something to make them second guess what the problem is. If they hear from their own people that these are the problems, maybe they, they would take a minute to actually, you know, research it themselves a little bit more, or at least have another side of the story to tell. So, and it's our goal to get that side of the story as well. So, you know, Eritrean people that feel like there aren't any problems in Eritrea and Eritrea is a peaceful society, we'd love to hear from them. You know, I, I, I would love to. I mean, the nice thing about the United States is we have freedom of speech. I, I will never say that I'm 100% right on anything. I will listen to everyone side of the story. The, the nice thing, as I was saying, about having the freedom of speech is you have the ability to say something and be heard. From what I've gathered from the refugees is that freedom doesn't exist in Eritrea. So as we come to, uh, to the closing uh, part of the program, let's talk about the project that you have. It's your game plan. How are you planning to proceed? Where do you go from here? When are you planning to, uh, to uh, complete the project? And so can, can you educate us uh, where you go yeah, from this sure. point on? Sure. So we've, um, we are probably 85 to 90 percent finished the editing of the project. You know, making a documentary has a lot of moving parts. There's music to be made and color to be done and more shooting to be done and, and, and all of that. Um, I'm planning on finishing the documentary by spring of this year. I feel, I feel pretty good about where the story is right now. But what, what we're trying to do is, you know, some of the things that we're going to shoot will be just to add to it, to make it a little bit more digestible to, you know, the American people to watch a story. And with so many blurred faces, we're going to shoot a little bit more just to get people's imagination going, to really think about what it is that, that's happening in the country and the stories of the refugees that we hear. So what we're doing is raising money through a Kickstarter campaign you know, to to raise money for the next two weeks, we're 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 fundraising, and then um, we will shoot the rest and finish the editing. And the reason why we're we're doing a fundraising is two reasons. One is it's really raised awareness in my community. You know, among my friends, among my peers, among the people in this area, and also in other countries. That's number one. Number two, the raise raise the money is just to finish it quickly, because I feel like the longer we wait to finish this film, the longer um, refugees suffer around the world. And I think it's, motiv it's motivated me to really you know, finish this thing fast. Who is the likely audience? Who gets to see it? And where do you intend to, uh, to share it? And would Eritreans actually get to see their own story as depicted in a documentary? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, the plan is the more, the more, the, the wider the audience, the better. And right now we're, we will talk to HBO or PBS or larger networks to be able to, to take notice of the story. I mean, at the very least, it will be available online and downloadable. We'll print DVDs and all of that. We will have to kind of subtitle for uh, De Grenia, and uh, that's something that we're planning on doing. That's it's a lot of work just in itself, but um, I think that's something that's important for the grain speaking people and for um, Eritreans to be able to see that in their own language, I think is important. So, um, yeah, we have, we have that to do too. So uh, obviously the, the larger the audience, the better for us. You know, that's our goal really to have it seen by more, as many people as possible. Chris Carter, uh, we are absolutely uh, delighted that you could share uh, Eritrean's uh, story, which is uh, not pleasant, but we appreciate that you have taken the initiative to uh, come up with a project that we hope, we sincerely hope will be successful and that people around the world will be educated about our situation. Uh, we want to wish you the best of luck and but also want to give you the opportunity. Is there anything you would like to share with our audience? I would say if you're interested in the story, you can go to um, the Eritrean Exodus .com, um, and read more about the film 
you know, if you feel inclined to back the film and fund the film, there's a link to our Kickstarter page there. And um, you can see pictures about, you know, on the trip and read the press release. And you can get a little bit more informed on what it is that we're doing. Uh, the other thing I would say to any Eritreans that are are listening, hang in there. You know, we're, we're, we're all in this together and uh, we're going to work and try to get you uh, a little bit of help here. Well, Chris, uh, you responded very promptly to our request for an interview. We appreciate your time. And uh, again, we would like to wish you the best of luck. And if there is anything at all that we can do to help you out, please do let us know and uh, have a wonderful day. And uh, we appreciate the initiative. Uh, thank you, Dr. Russell. Thanks. Have a uh, great day yourself. Take care, Chris. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was Chris Carter, an American citizen from Philadelphia, he owns and operates a Taylor Made Media and uh, Tribe Sound Records. He spends his time producing music, and he also manages film and commercial video projects. Uh, he has produced many award-winning musical artists and works closely with several large organizations uh, here in the U.S. and overseas. And um, an experienced uh, man uh, who travels around the world, uh, the United States, Africa, Europe, Central, and South America. When uh, Chris is not traveling, he said, he is bound to be in his editing room or playing the drum with his band, Wave Radio. Thank you for listening to our program. My name is Russo Mesfin. Have a wonderful day. Even though I'm quite experienced traveling to refugee situations, meeting with refugees, visiting camps in, in several different continents, I was shocked by how many children there were and how bad the ratio was of adult supervision to children. <laughs> Okay, well, we're going to tell people about that. Okay.